Did you know that Alchemist Accelerator can operate a program for you? Welcome to Innovators Inside, the podcast for people working in corporate and government innovation. Brought to you by Alchemist X, the corporate services division of Alchemist Accelerator. Here you'll follow me, Rachel Chalmers, head of Alchemist X, as I talk to the industry's highest achievers and most compelling thought leaders. These are fly on the wall conversations with leading practitioners in the field. They'll share their lessons learned so that you don't have to go through the painful experiences that they did. So sit back, relax, and get ready to level up. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Latrice Barnett to the show. After almost eight years with Salesforce, Latrice is now a Senior Director and Regional Vice President for Partner Marketing Field Distribution. Before joining Salesforce, Latrice worked as an executive and interactive producer with the branding agencies Chibo Studios and Odopod. She has a degree in comparative literature from UC Berkeley, and she's an accomplished vocalist whose excellent 2006 album, Illuminate, is available on your favorite streaming service. Latrice, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. We've talked a lot privately, you and I, about how the tech industry is like the music industry and and how they're different. Do you want to expand on some of those thoughts? Sure. I think there are a lot of similarities. I mean, there's definitely like a lot of this wild, wild west vibe, you know, like it's very much, uh, I feel like the, the tech industry and the music world have just kind of both grown up outside of the more traditional paths, you know, they're not as regulated in, in the same ways as, you know, as, as, as finance or as healthcare. Right. And so there's a little bit more flexibility with what can and can't happen a little bit more creativity and ability to jump out and do things that are new than you would see in more highly regulated spaces. I think at the same time, it can also be challenging. Some similarities I've seen in both music and tech, it can be challenging for people who don't fit a certain profile to break out of stereotypical roles. Sometimes people who don't fit in these, uh, you know, in, into a, a certain profile can be painted as an exception as opposed to just a different path. In terms of differences, I think that one thing that I really valued and and sometimes miss from the musicals musical world is that I think peer critique is more accepted and expected in the arts as well as in music. And so I, I think there's more of a tendency in tech for people to look at peer review and critique as self attack, <laughs> you know, which is unfortunate um, only because I think that you don't, you know, necessarily always, you can't guarantee that your colleagues have gone through a process where they have to separate themselves their spirits from their actual product, you know, and so folks can take things a little bit more personally. That's a really interesting point. I think I bring that from, you know, I I, I dabble in fiction. I've had a little bit of short fiction published and I've, I've lived the workshop life. And I do run a lot of my startup critique sessions like writing workshops. And I say, you know, we're critiquing one another's ideas and work product and we're not critiquing each other. So try to introduce that separation of the person from from what they're working on. Um, that's a, a really interesting point. And I loved your characterization of both as the wild, wild west because they are geographically centered in, in San Francisco and L.A., And since the 50s, when these industries really started going in those cities, there has been that sense of freedom from the financial centers on the East Coast and from, you know, the white shoe law firms on the East Coast. And it's felt a lot more freewheeling and and able to innovate, as you say, but also even less tractable to, to people walking untrodden paths. I always like to talk about how people think large companies are more inimical to women, but then you look at Coca-Cola and it's created the careers of, of countless women and black people, male and female, because it's a large company and it has a powerful HR organization that's not only working in the company's interests, but working to make sure that there's representation and, and equal treatment. And that's the kind of center of gravity, I think, that you're talking about that Silicon Valley and the music industry don't have. There's no one central authority saying you can't treat outsiders badly. And so outsiders are treated badly. I think they can be. I feel like there's there's a spectrum here, right? There's like a couple of different extremes. There's kind of the folks who come at it more like traditional business in tech, right? And we're going to, you know, come at it with like, you know, if you don't have an MBA, if you don't wear these types of clothes, if you don't wear like, you know, those funny sneakers with the white soles, you know, like you're... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, like you, you look you... so bad, guys. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no judgments, but kind of a judgment. Um, but <laughs> you know, like if if you're not fitting a mold sometimes there are folks who really want to just kind of exclude you at the same time I think there are in both tech and in um you know the arts in the music industry I think there are people who are breaking down that stereotype uh, and not even asking questions about it in ways that I don't see as successfully in more traditional enterprises. I think about like, you know, I don't know, I don't want to name any particular artists because that'll date the, the podcast, but there are folks who I think are doing some pretty amazing things, whether it's with gender or race or, you know, all of the different ways that we present in our lives. I think we can call out Janelle Monet. I think Janelle Monet is timeless, still relevant in 200 years. I think it's hard to talk about any of this though without talking about the role that capital plays because the kind of peer critique you're talking about, where it does arise in tech, it's because people really care about the practice more than they care about their ego. And that's because at the heart of both tech and music is a creativity that people pursue independently from pursuing money. People might want to be musicians to get rich, but they also want to be musicians because music is beautiful and meaningful and and communicates. And there's that truth about software as well at the core of certain software products. And when you talk about the MBAs coming in with their ridiculous shoes, you're talking about people trying to capitalize on that and exploit and and harness uh, the surplus away from, from the creators. And I think that's a tension that we don't talk about often enough. I just want to throw that out to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's totally it. You know, I think about, you know, there are folks who don't have a choice, you know, as a musician. I didn't have a choice but to be a musician, just because it's not like what I'm doing to as my as my core salary or, you know, income stream. It doesn't mean that I'm not a musician to this day. You know, like it is not a choice. I can't like turn it off. I can't turn off being like, you know, a quirky, you know, person either. You know, like I there these this is just a part of my core. And I think that similarly, like, you know, you know, there are folks who go into, you know, software development because of the financial potential gain. But I think there are also folks who are like, oh my gosh, where else could I possibly be? Like, this is what I do. And I think there are a lot of, you know, what, what's funny is that there are so many similarities between the ways that musicians' minds think and software developers think, you know? Like, there is, I think about, um, you know, folks that I've met through Alchemist and, you know, thinking about how there's such a similarity, like, in, in thinking about music and the way that it allows you to kind of think three-dimensionally right there's the written um you know a to b part of it but then there's also the sonic sort of layers and and you know the experiential piece of it and that is so much of how software is developed i feel like that's a it, it for me it's a template for that and then you look at uh software developers who who also had a career in music like zoe keating and vienna tang and and some of their looping compositions which call back to steve reich and even even Bach, those mathematical truths at the heart of music are the same as the the ones at the heart of, of software. What can music and tech learn from each other? What what how could tech benefit from lessons learned in music and vice versa? I think that, I mean, this is more of a commentary on capitalism. I wonder, but like, I think that in tech there could be a little bit more of an art form appreciated. You know, sometimes it's not about the monetizable value. It's about what the need is. And that's very idealistic. I get it, but that's my musician side talking. I think also that one thing that I find is that musicians as a for, as like a forcing function of performing have to know their audiences. There are certain people in tech who get that, but that is not as widespread. Like every musician, you cannot be a musician without understanding your audience at least not a per, you know, not an active musician. You can be creating music for yourself, but you can't be creating it for for anyone but yourself without understanding your audience, especially when it comes to performance. And I think that that's a hard thing for folks to realize uh, in tech, especially when they don't come from an artistic standpoint. So to me, I think that that's like a, a major par- parallel is understanding, <laughs> I'm going to say three times, understanding your audience. And it's it's a huge part of what we're doing in Alchemist, and particularly Alchemist X, is is uh, promoting this doctrine of customer discovery. And it is revelatory when when people really jump on top of it. But you're right; it's it's the kind of intuitive connection that performers have 
programmatized and, and laid out in a way that, that folks from outside the creative industries can start to access it. It does touch on the values beyond capital as well, because quite often in the course of customer discovery, entrepreneurs will find a need that needs to be filled, that they become very passionate about, that, that potentially won't throw off a huge income stream. And and you have a choice as a, a startup supporter whether to push founders in the direction of these for-benefit ventures rather than for-profit ventures. And I, I'm really grateful that at Alchemist we do have the breadth of understanding in our management team to to encompass things like our community safety and wellness accelerator up in Alberta. Yeah, I think there's an importance. I mean, I think there are companies who do this well, who, you know, obviously every, you know, there's, there's a certain reality, the, the, the world in which we live, we do need to make capital. Um, but I think that there's also certain things that can be explored. You know, there's a, there's a certain creativity that happens when people are like, okay, like if I spend four days, you know, four and a half days of my week focusing on, you know, what makes money, can I spend a little bit of time focusing on just what is interesting and what you know if, if there's a need because sometimes sometimes those things can turn into monetizable things if needed um but they can they're they're such a great way of exploring where where our minds can go and how we can meet our needs better and i know you're coming to the end of your time with salesforce but i have to say benny off is the least worst billionaire i ever met he he still seemed like an actual person um, and he was a pioneer, really, in building a company that's immensely profitable, but also has something of a social conscience. That was really important to me. Um, it's funny because before I joined the company, I thought it was, um, you know, I'd had Salesforce as a as a client in the various, you know, agencies that I'd worked for and and had this, you know, kind of, un, you know, my only experience was kind of like, you know, seeing uh, how the impact of like Dreamforce on San Francisco, um, you know, and not being able to like, you know, get a reservation at the restaurant that I wanted to go to a particular, you know, night of the week or whatever. And I had a kind of like a very like, uh, they're like any other company. And it was when I got on the inside that I was like, okay, there is a little bit of a difference here. There is a real effort to give back in ways that a lot of companies talk about and few actually accomplish on the same scale. So I appreciate that a lot. And I think that that is a really, um, that has allowed me to, and encouraged me to think more broadly about ways that I can be impactful in my community and not feel like it's, and, and, and know that it's actually contributing to my overarching, you know, ability to show up in my job. Yeah, it shouldn't be an either or, it should be a both and. Yeah. And that's lovely. I mean, it's interesting because I think that so many companies, again, we all get, you know, I think folks get rewarded or feel that they're rewarded most when they just put money ahead of everything. And that's fun. You know, like some people are just wired that way. But I think that for me personally, I get a little bit more fulfillment in my everyday life when I can think about the art, the giving back the actual human element of, of the work that allows me to kind of, you know, really show up my best when I'm thinking about the money-making as aspects. There really are some things you cannot put a price on. What are you planning to do next? So I have joined a smaller company. Um, I feel like I kind of do this ping pong in my career. You know, I start big and I go small and then I, then sometimes, you know, there's, there's one company that I joined when they were pretty early and then they grew very quickly and got very big. And, you know, it's, I, I think about it in terms of left brain, right brain. I got to please all sides of my brain, uh, you know, every few years. And so I'm going to a smaller company, a much smaller company. I think it's point oh one percent of the size of Salesforce <laughs> currently, um, which is really, really thrilling. Um, but I'm, it's a small company. Um, should I name them here? Like, is that OK? Sure. OK. <laughs> All right. I'm going to a company called Crossbeam and they are um, just a smaller but, you know, exciting company. I think their product is amazing and I'll be their chief of staff, which is a really exciting and dynamic role. That's a fantastic role for you. I love what you said about using the left and right sides of your brain because startups really are about generating a new thing into the world. And then large companies are about maintaining that thing. And it's really 
a unique personality profile, the corporate innovator who can work on both sides of that line. I do not thrive in large companies. I don't maintain things well, but I build stuff all the time. So I'm really in awe of somebody who, who has both of those skill sets and, and the chief of staff role is, is where that really comes out to play. Yeah, it's exciting. I get to build. So I love to build, but I also love to kind of like, you know, I'm, I can maintain things and I've been in roles where that's been my role, where that's been my job. And I find kind of like that Zen space you have to be in in order to just like keep the lights on. But I think what's really exciting about having, uh, you know, a chief of staff role at, at a company this small, there is plenty of opportunity to build things and set that process and then give it to somebody who's able to kind of like, you know, maintain them and and help it thrive once we get it up and running you know i'm like i'm i'm excited to be the kickstarter and then share the responsibility with someone else to run run things so that i can kind of keep turning on the lights in the building and seeing how you know seeing how we can how fast we can grow it really is that touch point where uh, you know the processes that are necessary for a large organization to run and you're the one who is building them for this small organization that's been doing everything by the seat of its pants up until now. It's a, it's an exciting moment. It is. And I think one thing that I'm really excited about is having been at a few different larger companies and seeing, you know, like larger companies are amazing. They are, they are feats of nature, you know? Um, and, and I, I have utmost respect for the, you know, the, the challenges that have to be overcome at these different scales of growth right these 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 jumps that you have to 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 push through and having seen companies a a few different companies now push through you know like getting to a hundred people getting to a thousand people getting to ten thousand people and these orders of magnitude that shape that you know like groups of humans act differently at these different stages. I think we all know that. And so seeing the types of decisions that you make early on and how they can impact, you know, have these, these long reaching outcomes. Um, and I'm excited to kind of, you know, there, there's so many times I've been sitting at, you know, at Salesforce or at other companies in my past and thinking, Hmm, here we are at this juncture and I can literally play it back and see how this decision down here impacted where we are sitting today. And gosh, if we'd known then what we know now. And so now I get to sit at this, at this, you know, this earlier stage company and say, okay, these are the forks in the road that I know to look for. And there's going to be some that I miss because, you know, every organization, every group of people, every product is different. But I'm super excited to say, okay, if we go left instead of right here, can we set ourselves up for better or different success down the line? It has such a powerful cultural legacy. The decisions that are made at this stage become part of the mythology of the company. When you look back on your career to date, what are you proudest of? Growth. My personal growth, honestly. Um, I think that I have aimed to grow over time as a thinker and as a leader and as a colleague. I think those are three different things, three different directions that have been important to me to grow in. I think like many people, when I was younger, I was very focused on myself uh, and my own, whatever was going on in my mind when I was in my early twenties. And, (laughs) you know, and that's, I look back and I think, wow, I'm glad I'm not that person anymore. I'm glad I'm able to (laughs) think about my impact on colleagues. I'm able to think about things more deeply and kind of a little bit more um, multidimensionally as opposed to, I don't really feel like sending email right now. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to walk and get a coffee, you know, or whatever, you know, and also thinking about, uh, you know, how I've grown as a leader. You know, I feel like I've always kind of been, you know, like a leader doesn't necessarily mean a manager of people. It's, it's kind of like a mentality. Right. And I think when I was younger, I, I tended to lead by saying, here's what I want to do and I believe in it. And so therefore it's right, which was probably important for, you know, for, for the calcification of my ego, but less useful for working with other human beings. And so as my calcification of ego shrank into, you know, like not my number one priority, I think that allowed me to grow as a leader and thinking, okay, leading isn't just like, you know, having the right idea. It's actually stopping and listening and, you know, giving voice to the people who might not speak up with a loud, you know, next to me, right? 
that is my gift as a leader is to be able to shut up and listen to the folks, the other smart people in the room, and then help us all to come to the right decision together as a group. So that is the kind of growth that I'm most proud of. I think those are really recognizable developmental stages as well. I think the ruthlessness of one's 20s is just trying to find one's place and one's people. You know, you're, you're, you're jettisoning the past and, and you're setting out into a new world in order to, to find a place. And then in your 30s and 40s, you look back and say, well, this is the place that I want to be in. So I better start listening. I better start paying attention to the people here. Yeah. And you look at actually who has lasted the longest. I think, you know, cranky folks who, you know, may not be the kindest people make the most noise and show up first, right? <laughs> when, when, when you join an organization. But when I look at who has lasted with the type of reputation that I admire, those are the folks who aren't necessarily yelling and throwing staplers at their underlings, you know, like <laughs> it's the folks who are listening and elevating the bright minds around them. Yeah, the secret of leadership is is hiring people who are smarter than you, listening to them, and then acting on their advice, and suddenly you look like a rock star. And not just smarter than you, but fully different from you, fully, you know? I think that, like, I'm, I'm really embracing this whole idea of, like, people, you know, this diversity of perspective, you know? And it doesn't just have to do with, like, oh, I went to, like, you know, a different Ivy League school than you. Like, <laughs> it really has to do with, I come from a fully different walk of life. I have, you know, a totally different way of, you know, showing up in the world than you do. And like, I have totally different needs and draws on my personal life um, that are impacting the way that I think. And it's, it's that that kind of allows us to have just the best and most broad experience um, and the best minds, I think. Yeah, it's the difference between a monoculture and a redwood forest. If you had one do-over, what might you do differently? Just one, huh? I honestly would have stood up for myself and things that I believe in sooner. I went through a long period of self-doubt where I really kind of believed, I think, the things that people wanted to believe about me. Or I at least questioned, like, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not that smart. I would have definitely, you know, I, I, yeah, I think I would have stood up for myself much sooner than I ended up doing. I'm glad I did it eventually. And maybe that's the path that I needed to be on in order to, you know, because it was when I stood up for, it was when I started standing up for myself and not giving a rat's ass about like, you know, what's the worst that can happen? If I speak up for myself, I lose my job. I didn't want that job if that's what I, if that's, if that's the price, you know, and then having that kind of freedom allowed me to also speak up for other people. Yeah, it has to come from a place of surplus. You can't do it when you're feeling threatened. Right. And just realizing like, you know, when I realize I'm not scared of the threat, that was freeing. You have to get to that point though where you're willing to lose the job and, and that's that's hard and it's getting harder because of precarity. Right. And I mean, also that is, uh, that is a, a privilege that I have worked for, but it is still a privilege, right? Because not everybody can set, you know, has the ability to be like, yeah, you know what? Worst case scenario, I lose this job. That could be like, you know, literally taking down an entire family or community if people, if certain people lose their jobs. So I get that, like, you know, that's not something, you know, I've set up my life and have a partner and a family that, you know, and, and means to be able to support that kind of perspective. But I think that when we can, you know, when, when we can do that, when we can set ourselves up, whether it's like, you know, shrinking down kind of like our expenses if we can, which is also a privileged standpoint, but, you know, setting up our lives so that we are, our jobs are working for us instead of we are working to, to maintain our jobs, I think is ideal. And that's the point of, of having privilege. It's not to keep it and to keep yourself safe. It's to use it and to try and make other people a little safer as well. And bring folks along for the ride. I'm like, if I can help other good people, smart people, you know, drive that kind of empowerment for their own lives, that's that's what I'm here for. How would you distill all of this experience into, say, two or three lessons for our listeners? I think it comes down to a few things for me. Listen to how your colleagues make you feel. That's really important. Um, 
not to say that we should all be working amongst our best friends. You know, I think if I worked with my best friends, there'd be a lot more partying than working because they're my <laughs> best friends, <laughs> perhaps. Or either that or they wouldn't like me because I'd be in like Latrice work mode and I'd be like, no, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And they'd be like, you used to be so fun, you know. So <laughs> but listening to your colleagues and how they make you feel, I think, is still important because when I have worked with folks who don't make me feel valued, that's when I stop thriving. And I think that's a really important thing to listen to yourself. We, we are trained to kind of be like, power through, power through, power through, work at all costs, keep the job, you know, and that's not always the answer. So listen to how your colleagues make you feel. If you're in a, if you're in a toxic environment, do what you can to get out because that's healthy for you. Take the time you need to be successful. It doesn't necessarily have to follow a, a path that looks like everyone else's. I mean, I've had folks that have, in an interview, have called it, have like, I don't know if they thought they were calling me out or something by being like, so... You were a musician for a long time. What makes you think you can do tech? And it's just like, what makes you think I can't? Yeah, you know, like, it's not, not rocket science. Hello, exactly. I'm not trying to, like, work at, I'm not trying to be a medical doctor. I'm not trying to do surgery on anybody. I am literally trying to, like, you know, find other ways of, 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 be, of adding value to my community, right? And there are so many different ways to do that. And not everybody has to have the same path. I remember feeling, you know, like, maybe I should be doing these things or getting these types of letters behind my name or blah, 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 blah. And not everybody has to go that path in order to find success and fulfillment. I think it's curiosity that gets you there. I think it's listening to what is inside your heart and, and doubling down on, on, on your path to get there. And then I think the other piece is, you know, that curiosity that I mentioned, asking questions and asking questions and playing back what you hear. So much of what I've been able to accomplish in my life so far has been because I align with people and I aim to, you know, I'm like, here's what I'm hearing from you. Is that right? You know, and not only does that al allow me an opportunity to say, did I hear this right? And, and for folks to either correct or confirm, but it also kind of like, you know, it drives connection and, and allows you to kind of really make sure that where you're going is, you know, it allows you to show, to, to see who is going to help you on your path and who might, uh, you know, be on a different path themselves. Yeah. You definitely don't need any more letters after your name. Literature covers it. Like, Thank you. Comp lit is a terminal <laughs> degree. It's, it sets you up to learn everything else. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I think it's, I, I used to, I remember like having folks that were just like literature, what are you going to do with that? Everything. You know, oh, you're going to be poor for the rest of your life. And it's like, no, I've learned how to think. I've learned how to tell a story. I've learned, you know, which is a huge part of what we do every single day. So I think analytical thinking is good. How do you avoid burnout? Do you avoid burnout? It's a journey. I used to think I was so exceptional and different and I'm not like anybody else, but I think what, for me, the, the magic combo is getting enough sleep, going to bed at the, at, you know, at a decent hour and having a, a standard schedule, exercising regularly, eating right, and then spiritually prioritizing my family, seeing friends and prioritizing activities that are important to my spiritual and creative growth. Like that stuff is, that's what I need. It's those six things. What are the early warning signs for you? How do you know you're coming off the rails? I mean, my exercise stops getting prioritized, more glasses of wine in the evening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I find, you know, there are times that, you know, like, I mean, sometimes, I, and I'm not talking about like cycles where you're just like, you know, I got to, you know, be in a high delivery mode for about a week or two. Um, but I think that my whole healthy perspective goes sideways and then I start to get a little bit negative and and then I think okay I gotta I gotta make some changes I gotta get back on the things that are healthy and good for me I'm not making enough music or I'm not cooking enough or I'm not you know just hunkering down and having downtime with my family enough what is the best way for our listeners to connect with you or to follow your work gosh that's a great question um I think you know, LinkedIn is always somewhere that I put bits and bobs. Um, I'm not religious about it, but I think it's a nice spot to kind of like um, to, to showcase the the major things that I'm excited to publicize. Musically, I think I'm doing some stuff um, here and there. I'm in I'm in a creative creating pattern as opposed to a, a sharing pattern right now. But generally when I am putting when I'm releasing music, it is on things like Spotify or CD Baby. 
What does the future look like for you personally? We've talked a little bit about CrossBeam. What else do you have planned? Gosh, that's going to be, I mean, you know, take, taking on a new uh, and expanded role is always, that's going to be the big push professionally. That's going to take up a lot of time and energy. I'm, I'm learning how to play piano. Oh, so wow. that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I've been taking lessons for several months and falling back in love with music theory. I go in and out of it um, and really kind of digging into that. So I'm making you chief of staff of the entire tech industry. For the next five years, every decision gets made in a way that you would approve of. What does the world look like five years from now? Oh, man, that would be glorious. All the boards, all the executive leadership teams have true variety, diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, diversity of appearance. Gosh, if it were up to me, I don't, I mean, I would honestly put a lot more women in charge, women of color too. I mean, like, and I say, uh, I mean, the the expansive, uh, inclusive women term. I think I would also really, really fight to put a lot of empathetic processes in place to replace some of the patterns and the habits that our culture has fallen into. I mean, we're coming off, what, two and a half years of enormous scale societal trauma. I I don't see how we move forward without empathy and without acknowledging the damage that we've taken on. It's been so delightful to have you on the show, Latrice. Really looking forward to to your next album. Really looking forward to hearing about the Chief of Staff role as it expands. We'd love to have you back. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Great to be here. Always always a, a thrill to talk with you. This has been Alchemist X Innovators Inside. You can find the transcript of this conversation, plus links to whatever books, articles, TV shows, and apps we talked about on our blog. And stay connected by following us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you found the podcast valuable, feel free to share or tell your colleagues. We love hearing from you. Send us your comments, feedback, suggestions for future guests, or just say hi by emailing us at innovators at alchemistaccelerator.com. 